Vice President for Research and Professor of Computer Science at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute to give a distinguished lecture today at the Ski Institute. Uh, Fran has a number of uh, awards, just among them she's a fellow of the ACM, fellow of the IEEE, she's currently the co-chair of the National Academy's Board on Research Data and Information. Uh, she was the inaugural recipient of the ACM IEEE CS Ken Kennedy Award for Influential Leadership in Design and Development and Deployment of National Scale Cyber Infrastructure. She has been a professor of computer science at uh, UCSD, and she had an endowed chair there, was uh, director of the, the San Diego Supercomputing Center for a while. She's really been influential nationally and internationally um, with, uh, in computer science, and specifically uh, about data and, and corresponding infrastructure. So, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fran Berman. Do I need this or can you hear me if I just talk regularly? Are we good? Good. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for having me. It's really a delight to be here. Uh, this is a magnificent place and the conversations have been even more magnificent. So, um, thanks so much. And uh, looking forward to the rest of the day. Um, uh, this is always a treat for me. This is an area that um, I've been working in for a long time, data. And data seems to be reaching the tipping point in our national consciousness and certainly our global consciousness as, um, as the absolutely key element it is for everything we're doing here in the 21st century in the information age. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a variety of aspects of that today. And uh, let's get started. So let's talk about the world we live in. And um, I think most of us, uh, perhaps all of us, uh, would not know what to do uh, without the kind of information we get from our digital devices. Um, it has permeated everything we do. We might be reading our news on it. We might be playing our games on it. Um, our industries are driven by it. Um, in the academic uh, environment, uh, data permeates everything. We have um, data opportunities available to us. We have data challenges. We have new problems that we didn't have a decade or two ago. Cyberbullying, um, reputation problems with your reputation online, etc. So everywhere you look, it's a data-driven world. And uh, that's not going away. So the genie is out of the bottle, and this is a genie in a world that we will be living with uh, you know, for uh, uh, the foreseeable future. Now, for those of us in the research environment, data has been particularly important. So there is not uh, one societal problem, and likely not one uh, problem in the research arena, that is not driven big time by the importance of data. When we're thinking about the impact of global warming, we're looking at all kinds of sensor data about climate, about terrain, about all kinds of things. Uh, when we're looking at uh, natural disasters, being able to see things in real time, being able to model things, being able to understand things makes a difference. Data drives how we deal with disease, how we deal with treatment, how we deal with populations, how we deal with genetics. Um, energy is driven by data. Um, the power of social data is something we're just being able to harness. But it would be unimaginable to us, um, even a decade ago, that the Prime Minister of Egypt would resign on Facebook. But that happened a few years ago. We had our first cyber election. When you think about all of the data that came to bear at organizing, at uh, getting the message out in 2008, and we're seeing it again. You know, all of the candidates are on YouTube, all of the things that are happening. And maybe the most important piece of this is there's a whole generation of people, including people in this room, people that are going to be our leaders now, people are going to be our leaders in a decade, and people are going to be our leaders for the foreseeable future that have never known a world without the internet. That's the world we're living in. Where kid, there, you know, for those that are our parents, those are the, the people in our kids' bedrooms. Um, for those of you who are undergraduates, this is the world you grew up in. Um, and these are our leaders for the next decade or two. And that's going to change a lot. It's going to change the way we see things. And there's a real sort of generational component on that. So 
Today I want to talk mostly about the research arena. That's something that I think we all know a lot, but it really expands to the real world in a lot of ways. And I'm going to hit kind of four different things with varying lengths. My first thing I want to talk about today is data-enabled research and innovation, where data is coming in, just a sprinkling of different areas. Then I want to talk about data infrastructure. How do we host all of that data? What do we do with it? What are the issues there? I want to talk about what's arguably the Achilles heel of our data-driven age, which is who is paying for all of this data. There are bits in the air, and there are bits defining all of us. However, what are we going to do with those bits? Who's making sure those bits are going to be there tomorrow? And then I'm going to end with just a few challenges um, that I've been thinking about for a data-driven society, for which I hope you all come up with the answers um, at some point. Okay. So let's talk about some different things. And um, here's, here's sort of, a, you know, we're really interested and uh, <coughs> hearing about the virtual observatory um, who is bringing in um, a lot of data from the big telescopes around the world, slicing and dicing it, putting it in databases. And now the internet is your best observatory because you can see all of the data around the sky, you know, in time, at different frequencies, et cetera. In, uh, through, the, uh, through the observatory. So what are we doing with that? Well, Heidi Newberg and some of the folks from Milky Way at Home, which is uh, one of these kind of large-scale citizen science type of applications, like SETI at Home and Folding at Home and these other at-home things, um, are actually looking at large sky surveys and actually have come up with new results based on everybody taking a chunk of data, processing that data, and returning the, the results. So now you're seeing sort of data coming through all of these great instruments that we've built around the world, um, being put in a data collection, being taken by a set of researchers, many of whom are not professional researchers, that being aggregated and new results coming out of that. And this is a, an example of a result that they had where the Sagittarius dwarf tidal stream, uh, they sort of understood and, and discovered that. And by the way, since I am here at the heart and land of visualization. My apologies up front for not having anywhere near the real visualizations here. You'll have to give me some for my next talk. Okay, here's another thing. This comes from SDSC some time ago and the uh, Southern California Earthquake Center. And here's what these guys were trying to figure out. What would happen if there was an earthquake on the southern part of the San Andreas Fault that goes through Los Angeles? And what they did is take an earthquake model that they thought would be similar to what would happen in that kind of terrain. And they used sensor data from around the LA basin. And then they um, looked at it. And the start of that earthquake would be somewhere there near Palm Springs. I think it's going to go again. I hope it goes again. Um, yeah, there it is. So it starts right about there. The seismic waves start coming down the San Andreas Fault. And notice what happens when they all pass through LA. So they're passing through LA now, big seismic waves, big earthquake. And the problem is after they pass, LA is still shaking. So you still see that activity there. And what they discovered with this simulation is that through these aftershocks and the way that LA is shaking, and that's because LA is kind of a sediment-filled bowl. So it's like a sediment-filled bowl full of jello. So imagine, you know, the shocks come down, it's still shaking. What can you do? And what they've done is they've taken, these are some old results, but they've taken this set of results and newer sets of results, and they're actually taking that not just to understand the science behind this and the geoscience behind it, but to inform how you might have building codes. So how can you build things that retrofit things so they're particularly useful um, in withstanding the kind of shocks and earthquakes? How can you get first responders to go to the right places at the right time where you're likely to see the most damage. So all of these scientific results make a big deal in terms of what we do in real life. Here's another way that uh, we're using data all the time. The Protein Data Bank is a worldwide resource. It represents billions of dollars of research, not into the database itself, but into the, um, the life sciences work that's being recorded in the database. And if you look at the averages, of structures in the PDB, you went from you know 1976, where there were roughly you know 500 structures or less per year, uh, to now. And this isn't even up to date. 
where there is greater than 5,000 structures uh, in one year, greater than 65,000, probably 70,000 70, or more uh, at this point in time. Those structures are tremendously important. They're used by people in research, and, and they're used by clinicians, they're used by life scientists all mm -hmm. over the world. It's an absolutely critical database. What would happen if it's not there? You could get this information back, but at billions of dollars and lots of time, it would really, um, it would really deter the kind of research we are doing instead of accelerating. <coughs> Beyond science, people are using data as well. This is data from a choreographer. And this is, you know, modern day choreography has really kind of gone past the kind of practitioner-mentor relationship to um, using the internet and data and, you know, all of our different information technologies in really interesting ways. Um, it turns out that um, Kickstarter was used by this choreographer to pay her dancers, so she actually created an online pledge drive. Um, it turns out that she put um, uh, snippets of the uh, dances she created on YouTube, and um, if she in fact you know, dealt with reporters who were going to talk about her choreography uh, remotely. She was in New York City and the dance uh, company was in Chicago and, and she was doing that. So, all of these kinds of things are really informing the way we do things, you know, certainly outside of science and engineering and in the arts as well. Um, our education is just, just at this um, incredibly interesting time where we're now kind of blowing apart the traditional ways we teach things in universities and we're looking at a whole new model of how people learn. If you look at uh, the Khan Academy, what's happening with uh, through his work and he now has uh, a website, Udacity, Immersive Education, etc. And um, a lot of the universities really looking at what it means to have online education. You know, maybe you take a course from me and I decide that you need to know something about robotics and instead of, you know, having you take the robotics prerequisite, I just say go online and learn that. You know, we're doing these kinds of things all of the time. Code Academy uh, is a really good example of that. Um, this is just the beginning of this, and it is really going to change the face of the way we do work in our universities, as is the research space. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. So as we look at the emerging technologies, particularly in um, uh, computer science and information technology, they are also increasing the focus on data. We hear a lot of talk in the high performance computing community about exascale. It's the new brass ring. We hope to grab that brass ring uh, by the end of this decade. It's going to create um, a complete paradigm shift in a lot of things, including uh, how do you power a machine at 20 megawatts or under? How do you create a machine with a programming environment where you can take, uh, take advantage of a machine that has roughly 25 million more processors than you have cells in your body. I mean, this is a, an amazing thing for us to try to do. And we're doing that at a time when more and more people are completely immersed in a world where our low-level devices um, give us more information, are easier to use. So, you know, imagine pairing your exascale environment and with a, there's an app for that kind of programming environment. And you know, what will that mean for us? And what will it mean when exascale is at the top of the branch of the pyramid, which means that petascale and terascale go down to the commodity level? What will our smartphones or our smart devices or our devices that are implanted or whatever look like in the decade? So all of those things, it turns out, data is huge. Um, uh, I was amused, and perhaps many of you saw the uh, Watson win Jeopardy uh, recently, which was um, complete fun and involved a lot of very serious um, AI work, work to um, really make that happen. What, imagine when you take these kind of ex-analytics, Dr. Watson, Lawyer Watson, um, you know, Plumber Watson, you know, whatever, um, to really help you do your work. So now IBM is pairing with, uh, I think it's WellPoint, the insurance company, and what they're doing is they're trying to see if they can help doctors improve cancer diagnosis and, pre and treatment by training a Dr. Watson, which, who is a physician's assistant, not a physician themselves, to really help understand all of the different uh, literature that's coming out, all of the different studies, etc. 
These are kinds of things that will become commonplace uh, over the next decade. Crowdsourcing, the DARPA network challenge, looking for the red balloons, happened in 24 hours. In fact, I think it was your colleagues at MIT that did that. Um, it was incredibly um, interesting and important to think that you could you could bury, or not bury, but you could, you could place things all over the United States and the social network would find it. And so these kinds of uh, paradigms, these kinds of modes really change the way we do things, not just in research, but in industry and in government and real life, etc. And um, it's, it's just going to make our, our uh, world and our jobs more interesting. So let me talk um, to some, uh, in some sense, about all of the stuff that underlies it. It's fun to talk about Watson, but the fact is you need a computer, you need a system, you need data. Uh, somebody's got to worry about how to host that, how to make it safe, how to pay for it, all of those kinds of things. And typically, we're talking about what the data can do in terms of sort of letting the data live in some sort of safe and, and useful way itself. So let's just talk about infrastructure. And the fact is, is that all data has a life cycle. And so what happens is the first thing you do is you create data. And in the research world, we create it from a whole variety of different things. Might be the CERN Large Hadron Collider, might be our digital camera, might be our laboratory experiments or our sensors, all of those kinds of things. But data will be created one way or another. Then typically we want to do something with that data. We might want to clean it, we might want to organize it, we might want to add relationships to it, um, we might want to you know, do things that will make it usable by us. In the research community, it's particularly important is the next step. How are we going to use it? How are we going to reuse it, make it available to our collaborators, or make it uh, available for replication of a set of experiments, etc. We want to analyze it, and mine it, and model it, and all of those kinds of things. And, and those are things that we want to do with our data. The next thing we want to do is get the message out. And this is a particular, uh, particularly area, interesting area uh, at this point in time. And when I say publish, I mean publish writ large. So, you know, I might want to publish it through a portal. Just put it on the internet <coughs> where anybody can use it. I have a website. You can, you can download, you know, anything that I put up on my website. You might want to couple your data with literature. You might want to um, create some portals. One of the things that the publishing companies are now um, worried about is with the way we can disseminate data, how do they kind of keep control of journals? You know, how do they make a business model out of it? How do they kind of keep the journals, you know, uh, going forward, etc.? And there's a big argument about that in the publishing community in terms of, you know, um, are, is there going to be more control, but then you sort of understand and vet the results, versus is there going to be less control, you know, in this sort of garage band space where anybody can put anything out on the internet, but you don't know if it's good or bad, you don't know if it's right or wrong, you know, etc. We'll talk a little bit about that. But so publishing comes out to be um, a big deal. And then at, at, at the end or the middle or, or whatever in your data's life, you may do something conscious to preserve it or not, to destroy it or not, to just ignore it. It might be so valuable to you that you'll recognize, hopefully, that one copy of your data is not enough and that you have to make multiple copies in order to really kind of reduce the probability that of data loss or uh, data problems. But one way or another, your data is going somewhere. And it may be in the big, big, big bucket in the sky, but, uh, but it's going somewhere. And if you care about it, you can do something conscious to make it go where you want it to. So um, one of the things we were really delighted to hear, because this is the data cyber infrastructure um, uh, uh, underlies all of what we want to do is this, um, this recent program on big data. And Chris and I were talking about this this morning. Um, um, so there's good news and there's, um, there's um, not as good as it sounds news. And the good news is that here's a 200 million program and the focus is on big data. So the, the spotlight is now on big data. And I was telling Chris that my own feeling is this is tremendously important. Because up till now, for the most part, when you hear people talk about data, at least with respect to research data, you're hearing um, there's climate science and that's really important and we've got a lot of data. There's energy and that's really important. 
and we've got a lot of data. But now we're just saying we've got a lot of data. And that, so that elevates data from kind of a second class citizen to a first class citizen in those priorities. The, the not as good as you think it is news is um, that it's a 200 million program, but our understanding so far is that most of that is kind of rebranded from other programs. That being said, the focus on data is tremendously important. Now, this is called big data. And um, I think we all get why we love big. You know, supercomputers are big, and you know, and, and all kinds of things are big. But the fact is, um, data is not just about size. And really, kind of the most interesting things with data happen at the extremes. But the extremes aren't always about size. So, you know, you can look at the time component, and then extreme means your attention time frame. So, you know, either I want to keep data, you know, now, today, this week, for a year or two, or forever. You know, what does it mean when I want to keep data forever? Um, we want to talk about data that's um, prepared in various ways. If I have really unstructured data and I'm trying to put a bunch of data collections together, you know, that's a much more time-intensive, labor-intensive activity than if I have well-structured, interoperable collections. There's a lot of data that um, is extreme because it's subject to a lot of policy uh, and regula regulatory restrictions. Um, HIPAA data is especially a good example of that. But there's data, for example, um, that where the access must be controlled in various ways, and, and that's really important. Life cycle plan. Some data you know, has a data management plan, other data does not. Um, some data, you know, uses community standards. Other people just roll their own and make things up because it's more expeditious. Um, some data um, can be shared broadly within the community, and some data people keep very selfishly. Typically, that has something to do with the culture in the community as to whether that data represents a competitive advantage. So in the life sciences, your data often uh, represents a competitive advantage. So you don't want to give it away because you want to get the papers and you want to get grants. In astronomy and often in computer science, you know, you'll give your data to anyone, you know, after whatever time frame you need to publish it because it doesn't give you a competitive advantage. So typically there's a whole cultural thing going on. And of course, uh, size matters as well, but it's not the only thing. So if you think about what you need to do to be a good steward and host your data, it turns out that you need to do a lot of different things. And the more um, coordinated these things are, the better. Um, you need to preserve the data for as long as, and store the data uh, for as long as you think you, you need to. Uh, you might need to integrate the data uh, across various collections. You need to provide access for the right people to access your data. Uh, they will want to use and reuse it. You need to manage your data over time. Um, data services, tremendously important. You want to do visualization. You want to do analytics. You want to do uh, uh, domain-specific tools. You want to apply some statistical packages to it. Your data will come from a lot of different things instruments and sensors and computers and various other things. And you'll be doing a lot with it. You'll be analyzing it and modeling it and uh, simulating with it. So the idea here is that there's a lot of moving parts to this. And so if we want to create a coordinated um, enabling data cyber infrastructure, we need to be really thoughtful about it. Maybe you do it all in one place. That's one of the things when I was director of San Diego Supercomputer, <coughs> We provided, uh, or we tried to provide, kind of a one-stop shopping place for the data that we hosted. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, that's just one model. For most of our data, that will not be what people do. So you will be sort of grabbing a service from one place and having a, the repository be another place, uh, et cetera. So, um, so, you know, you really, really have to think carefully about what is the life cycle of the data and what is kind of the best stewardship model. Um, cybersecurity, always the Achilles heel. And, um, and there's a slew of different um, questions. Um, I, guess the, I guess Achilles has two heels, economics and security. Um, so um, perhaps Achilles will be a centipede by the time I'm done. I have no idea. Um, but the idea is like, who should you trust? Can you trust your hardware? 
Can you trust your system and your software? Can you trust whoever's responding to you? Uh, it turns out that when we're looking at data, there's a number of different solutions that we need to, um, to address kind of the data challenge and the cybersecurity challenge. Um, value data must be replicated. What happens if one place is safe and another place is not safe? So um, this is a, a class I brought with me from SCSC. This is with a slammer virus. Um, basically used kind of a denial of service approach and kind of hit the whole world, um, uh, taking down a lot of stuff, including Bank of America, ATMs, and you know, an airline and stuff like that. But you know, these things we'll see more and more of. And it's always the case that we're solving the problems that we've seen um, or, or that we're, we're um, inclined to solve the problems that we've seen versus the problems that we're not going to see. So, you know, uh, good to go on maybe uh, not too many shoe bombers, but, you know, what's the next thing that will happen um, when I worry about security when I fly? So, you know, and what are we doing to think about that? Um, data cyber infrastructure has to do really boring things, and it's hard to get money for doing boring things. It has to be reliable, it has to be predictable, it has to be capable, uh, it has to be accessible, sustainable, etc. Um, a lot of things can go wrong. Um, your file can get corrupted, uh, your, uh, the copies of your tapes um, can uh, simultaneously fail, your system can have bugs, your archives can get hit by a tornado. You know, all of that will happen on a regular basis. And you need to have a disaster mitigation plan in place to understand what to do with your data. Now, um, typically going to your stakeholder and saying, you know, we need funding uh, to make sure we don't get hit by a tornado or that, you know, our data is predictable is, is not, you know, an exciting thing to do. And, and typically what you see is you don't, you know, you don't see, uh, you know, a, a big newsworthy article that says, you know, uh, no problem with the data. Um, just like you don't see, you know, anybody noticing that there's a problem with the lights until the lights turn out. But the fact is that we're going to have that problem with our data more and more. So social security numbers, they've been lost. That's what gets the news. Um, recently, IBM and Iron Mountain, um, very strong companies, these things happen, you know, lost a bunch of data. Uh, from California. That's been all over the news. Um, every company is going to have this. And so one of the things that we need to do, this is our job, is to help make the case that the data bill for us in the 21st century is just as important in many ways as the light bill and the water bill and the power bill and has to be part of our infrastructure. Um, data incurs real costs. It may be that the cost of storage is going down, but all the other things that we have to do with it are not. Data professionals, we need those folks. Um, if you read the IDC, IDC report from 2011, um, we're likely to see 75-fold in the number of files that hold our data. We're likely to see one and a half times the number of data professionals going forward. We have a big problem now. It's just going to get bigger. Um, all of these kinds of systems, security and failover systems, UPS systems, people, training, documentation, regulation, monitoring, reporting costs, all of that stuff costs money. And uh, as things become more and more regulated, and we have to be uh, more and more regulated, we're going to have to do it. Um, as people want to store more and more data, you have to kind of keep up with it. Um, uh, when we had uh, Data Central at SDSC, we allowed our users to keep data at SDSC, and, and we made another copy of it. And we had to, we, what we found is we, as we went up the linear line, our storage needed to have to go up on that step function just to keep ahead of what our users would need. And so anybody who is uh, storing data has to worry about that because every time you jump up another step, that's more money. So, um, so the, the economics of this gets really challenging. Um, as, we, as we are now living in you know, the time of data management plans, um, we're in good shape in the center of this. Locally manageable data, I'm going to share it with my collaborators and we'll put on my hard drive, good to go. Um, as it turns out, when I get out in, out on that, for very large data, I can't put astrophysics data um, simulating uh, the universe after the Big Bang, 
comes out of two or three hundred terabytes, can't put that on a hard drive really in a, in a feasible way. Long with data, data that has to be coupled with particular kinds of services, um, access or control, um, uh, data that needs more management or more stewardship or more of something, all of those things make it more expensive. So um, all of the, both the technical challenges and the costs increase the extremes. So what's the solution? And um, the fact is we don't have yet a coordinated, cohesive national solution. I personally think that there will be no Esperanto solution. There won't be sort of one big data archive and, you know, the government will do it or Google will do it or someone will do it and everybody's data will fit into it. I think, you know, we live in a world where things just happen in various communities. They get sewn together in different interesting interoperable ways. And I think we'll see a solution that includes uh, many sectors. In the public sector, the government will provide some support for some of our data. The Protein Data Bank, for example. Um, uh, census data, for example. In the academic sector, this is a really important role for our university libraries. University libraries um, are, are know a lot about all the things that we need to know about in storing research data. They know about curation, they know about reliability, they know about sharing, they know about IP, they know about access. Um, this is a really important new role for university libraries. However, um, a lot of them need a little bit of funding to get jumpstarted. So they can build capacity in a data workforce in a, and put into place um, a business model that will make it sustainable. But that's, that's something, that's, that's a good direction and a direction we can go for. In the private world, um, there's a lot of folks with a lot of capacity. Google has a lot of capacity, Amazon has a lot of capacity, Microsoft has a lot of capacity. There's a lot of folks. Now, they're private companies and they have to make a profit, otherwise they're out of business. So what would incline them to host uh, data that's in the public good, including research data? And um, one of the things that would help them is if there was some carrots in the system and sticks for doing it that way. If there was a tax incentive that if you were Google or Microsoft or you know, a, a company and you had capacity to spare, perhaps you get a little tax incentive for storing data and there's a contractual arrangement by which you must transition that data in some sort of careful way if you decide you're not in that business anymore. Those things could happen. And between the three of those things, we could coordinate them to really a national research data infrastructure. And that's a, that's a good uh, uh, focus for us. So let's get, to, uh, let's get to economics. And it turns out that um, economics, as we all know, is very, very challenging. Uh, for digital preservation. And one reason we, um, whereby we might not really think of this so much in the research uh, arena is we've been kind of in a data Napster land. Uh, we're assuming that someone will host our data somewhere and we don't have to spend our precious and very hard to get research dollars for that. Um, the library will do it, or the university will do it, NSF will do it. Um, you know, etc. It turns out that um, that that is not a viable <coughs> and sustainable approach, and so we're going to have to really enter the real world of economics and data in order to figure out how to do this. So the first thing for us to remember is if we want to see our data tomorrow or next year or five years from now, we better be doing something about it today. If we're ignoring it today, it's possible it won't be there tomorrow. And that includes our electronic medical records, which is going to be a whole brave new world. Even as we get over the hump of everybody getting up to speed, having electronic me medical records, changing it, then we're going to have to sort of figure out how we can um, address the vision of go to an emergency room anywhere, anytime, and they know ev absolutely everything about you from your electronic medical record. That's, that's sort of the kind of thing you'd like to see. So here's three of many questions that we need to ask when we start thinking about preserving valued data over the long term. First of all, what should we preserve? I'll talk about that in a little bit. Second of all, who is going to be responsible for that? And the third thing is, is who pays? Okay, so what should be saved? So 
IDC has put out a series of reports, I think they have three now in the data universe. And if you haven't seen them, uh, go, go look at them. They're fascinating. They talk about how much data there is. Um, this year, I think it's this year, um, we have about 1.78 zettabytes of data. And so that's roughly, uh, you know, this is not exactly correct, but so roughly about 25 billion times uh, the number of cells uh, in your body is the number of uh, bytes that we have. So that's a lot of data. Um, if you go to YouTube, there's a lot of data there. If you go to the Library of Congress, surprisingly, I think we're still at the hundreds of terabytes rather than the petabytes uh, level. A novel is about a megabyte. Uh, the World Data Center for Climate Database is uh, over 200 terabytes. Um, IBM Watson, I've seen different things between 15 and 30 terabytes. That's not really very much between 15 and 30 trillion bytes of data in their database. So they were doing a lot of sort of interesting analytics on the side. Um, this is um, a, a image from one of the IDC reports, and it shows the red is the available storage, and the blue is the amount of data. So we kind of pass that, um, the, the connecting point at, you know, <coughs> um, you know in 2007 um, at exabytes of data. And so all of the stuff that we're generating, and one can quibble with their methodology. There's lots of fun <laughs> quibbles you can make with their methodology, but, um, but the, the slopes are unmistakable. The gap is unmistakable. And the fact is that we're now generating more stuff Stuff that we don't necessarily want to keep, you know, the first draft of this talk, our tweets, our, you know, our uh, text to our kids, you know, whatever. You know, we might not want to keep all that stuff. So there's lots of stuff that we don't want to keep. Um, but the fact is, even if we wanted to keep it all, we don't have enough storage. Um, their prediction by 2023, uh, where the amount of digital data will actually exceed Avogadro's number, which is pretty amazing. So, you know, we are awash in data everywhere you look at. So now that we know we can't save everything, we actually have to be, you know, make some good informed conscious decisions about it. So what data do we want to save? And it turns out that the operable word here is we. So who is we? Well, if we as society, there's things that we have decided that we need to save. You know, everything uh, President Obama does on his Blackberry is saved by the National Archives for historical records. Uh, there's the census is saved. Um, there's all kinds of really important uh, records that we save all of the time. And so as a society, we've decided we want to do it. There's some things like the Shoah collection, Holocaust survivor testimony. You'll never be able to replicate that collection. You want to keep it uh, for time and memorial, again, as a, as a really important historical record. Um, the second thing is, as a research community, what do we want to save? So it turns out that there are a number of um, uh, data collections that are very, very important to particular communities. The Protein Data Bank, the Life Science, National, National Virtual Observatory uh, for the Astronomers, um, the uh, Panel Study of Income Dynamics for Social Scientists is a longitudinal collection, a whole bunch of different families, economic information, survey data, um, et cetera. They follow them over 40 years. So this is a data collection that gets more valuable as time goes on. These are things that we actually want to have a very strategic and reliable plan for saving this data. And then there's me. You know, I want to save my medical record, my Quicken data, you know, digital family photos. That actually is my actual family, not my digital family. <laughs> my son graduated from UCSD. Um, and, you know, but all of us have pictures like that that we want to keep over time. And, um, and we want, you know, I want Nick's uh, you know, grandchildren to see what a dude he was, you know, when he graduated from college. So, you know, there's these kinds of things that we want to keep. And we, have, we need to do something active because most of the stuff is not going to end up in the Library of Congress or the National Archives or, you know, or, or the University Library. Now, it turns out that as we figure out what we want to say, we are now being asked in a regulated way what we want to say by our funding agencies. And as you all have noticed, and I know your BPRs <laughs> noticed this, is that as of uh, 2011, we have to submit management plans that say what we will do with the digital products of our sponsored research. 
And you might just say, you know, this stuff is a throwaway. I'm not interested in keeping it. And that's fine. That's your management plan. But you might say, this is really important. I'm going to keep it for the length of the grant, and I'm going to share it with my collaborators. Or you might say, this is so important. I want the world to see this for the next 10 years. And then, how are you going to pay for that? And what are you going to do to make that happen? And who's going to catch that for you? So that's where we need some sort of infrastructure solution. Now, in addition to things that we want to say, there are things we actually have to say. And we're finding that in an era where we're seeing increasing regulations governing all kinds of things in our complex world, um, there are regulations telling us what we must do with our data. Um, there's HIPAA regulations that applies to health information. Sarbanes-Oxley looks at uh, US public company uh, boards and management and, and the data associated with that, including email. Um, OMB regulations for a long time have applied to our federally funded research. That's usually the part that we don't deal with as researchers. It's the part that happens in research administration. It's all of the records of the data, but now we may start to include the data itself, depending on how these things are. And there are penalties. So, um, so when, um, when regulations are not followed, um, there's a number of different uh, penalties, and, and we're going to see you know, <coughs> those sticks as well. And one of the things that you know, we deal with in university administration land is, how are we going to keep up with all of these regulations? Now, there's regulations where we have to keep more data about our researchers. You know, who you visit, or, who you, or where you go on vacation, or you know, whether you take your laptop to China, and these kinds of things. And, and so, you know, I'm being a little loose about uh, the way I talk about it, but there's more and more regulations which require more and more data to be kept in a way that we have to um, be doing this in a, in a reasonable, uh, credible way. So the, the question is, like, who's paying the bill for this? And, um, and everybody's favorite solution is, let somebody else do it. And, you know, uh, pick your favorite somebody else. Uh, the government will do it, the libraries will do it, Google will do it. Um, you know, the people who own the data will do it. You know, everybody's got this kind of hot potato thing or finger pointing thing going on. Um, we can't just let the private sector do it because it may not be in their own best interest as private sector companies to do this. You know, Google um, uh, volunteered to save health records and then it decided to, you know, end that program because it wasn't profitable for them. That's reasonable. They're there to make a profit. But if we assume that they're there to support um, data in the public interest, then we're making an erroneous assumption and we're, we're putting a weak link in, uh, in our chain. It turns out there's no magic bullet. There is no way that we're going to get you know, somebody else who actually has a ton of money where we don't to pay for our data. And what we do in the real world is we actually do a whole bunch of stuff. So sometimes we can get a federal grant to do it. Um, sometimes we pay for service. Amazon did a really innovative thing a while ago, this is a, a bit old, in where they actually had uh, you know, some extra, uh, some extra um, storage. And they said, OK, you can put your data on our stuff, pay per transaction, you know, pay per look at it. And that will be a service we'll provide. They made some money. It was a service for the community. Um, there are advertisements. That's how some of your data gets paid for on Google or Facebook. Um, Wikipedia uh, is asking for donations. So that's part of its business model. You can subscribe to things online. You know, we now have the New York Times subscription, the digital subscription online. Um, that's a change from how it was when they offered it for free because they have data infrastructure that they need to pay for. So one of the things that I've been involved with that, that's been a really um, satisfying thing is um, to actually look at data and economics in a serious way with actual economists, uh, which I am not. And um, so I co-chaired with uh, economist Brian Lavoie from OCLC um, the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Sustainable Digital Preservation and Access um, uh, a couple of years ago. And our charge was to, um, and there's the website if you want to uh, find it, uh, which we paid forward. So, that, so we had to actually figure out what the business model was for our own website. Um, uh, our charge was to conduct really a thorough analysis of kind of data economics. And then to provide 
um, actionable recommendations for what we could do as a society to actually start addressing some of these problems. Um, we had a terrific um, task force, a number of people from um, all across sectors. We had someone from the movie industry, <coughs> digital movies, big deal. People have to think about that a lot. We had people from um, uh, industry, people from libraries, people from science, uh, um, all over the place. Uh, people from the Smithsonian, also worried about things like that, etc. Um, so, um, let me tell you a little bit about what we found, and then we'll finish up. So first of all, we actually had to um, think about what economic sustainability meant for digital information. And it turns out that in order to be able to um, have economically sustainable data, you, you need at least four different things. First of all, somebody has to think that's a good thing to do. Somebody has to recognize the benefits of that. Um, second of all, there need to be some sort of incentives. Now that you recognize it's valuable, there's a lot of valuable things to do in the world. We don't do all of them. So somebody, something has in the system has to incentivize you know, a stakeholder to act and to do this thing that they've recognized as valuable. Um, you have to figure out what, which things are valuable. Turns out that there's a lot of stuff out there, not all of them are valuable. And then you need persistent structures for actually making it happen. You need to be able to allocate resources, you need to be able to have, you know, some sort of organization, some sort of governance, etc., to kind of make the whole system run smoothly. So one of the things we recognized is that part of the problem in the digital universe and, and uh, the economics of it is what you can think of as the stakeholder problem. And it turns out there is a lot of different stakeholders in, in digital world. There are stakeholders who benefit from use of the asset. Um, you know, I made a movie, it's Avatar. There's uh, the stakeholders who benefit are everybody who comes to see Avatar. There's um, stakeholders who select what to preserve. Um, you know, I'm making this up, I think it's right. Avatar is owned by a studio, distribution, uh, who can distribute it. They're gonna decide how long they keep um, the digital uh, stock and all of the different kinds of digital components of Avatar. There's stakeholders who have rights to the assets. So maybe it's distributed by one group, but it's owned by another group. There's stakeholders who preserve the asset. Maybe there's you know, one of the things that the Motion Picture Association is looking at is, you know, how do you get not just big blockbuster movies, but small independent movies um, to be preserved over time? Because they actually provide documentaries, for example, that provide an incredible historical record. Who's going to save those things? Who's going to have to save all of the indie ones, for example? And then there's the stakeholders who pay. So who pays to preserve it? Now, it turns out if all of those groups are the same groups, no problem. You think it's important, you have the resources, you pay for it, good to go. But it turns out that a lot of the time, you, you're not all in the same space. And so what we did is, with the Blue Ribbon Task Force, we looked at four different commonplace scenarios. So the first commonplace scenario is research data. Um, you're looking at um, basically you know, dark matter forming in the galaxy after the beginning of the universe in somebody's brain. And, and these are two kind of um, these are two examples of research data. So if you think about the stakeholders who benefit, it's the researchers and the general uh, public. Um, the researchers themselves often select what to preserve, unless there's a mandate from a federal agency saying, you must put this in the protein data bank, or you must save this for some reason. Um, who has rights to the asset? That's a really good question, because many of our grants go through the university. Does a researcher own that? Does the funding agency own it? Does the university own it? Um, who preserves the assets? A lot of times we don't know. We don't know what that answer is. We might just make it up as we go along. And who pays for the asset? It might be the funding agency, but they can't pay for everybody's everything. So in our world, um, this turns out to be really challenging. It's also challenging in scholarly discourse. Because now, um, if you add all of our papers, and the things that we'd like to preserve, you know, maybe our publishers um, pay for the preservation of that, and then we have our subscriptions. But if you think about it, um, the real world offers a much richer form of content these days than a lot of our stuff. If I look at the average New York Times article, 
There's audio, there's video, there's pictures, there's links. And I open up, you know, my science online, it's not nearly that rich. And so, you know, we have to start thinking as we look at a much more rich set of publications and dissemination, you know, how do we align with stakeholders? Um, another group is, which is, which is just fascinating, is, you know, our music, our movies, commercially owned cultural content, you know, a great deal of which is in the public interest and is interesting to the public and the public wants to see it preserved. <coughs> and I think about my music and over time, you know, I, I had LPs in my garage mm -hmm. um, with great album covers and, um, and my music has moved from those LPs to, you know, CDs, to, uh, you know, my iPod, to, you know, who knows what we're going to be playing our music on 10 years from now. But the fact is, if you try to find a record player today versus trying to find an iPod or uh, trying to download something to your smartphone, it's a different kind of experience. And so what we want is your music is actually a concept. It's actually bits that's, that's migrated over time. And what we want to do is make sure those bits are migrating forward if they're valuable to us. But who's going to do that? How are we going to make a profit for the music industry or for the movie industry? Or how are we going to incentivize them in some way to preserve the things that we think are important and that we're not preserving ourselves in the Library of Congress or whatever? And then this is the really the crazy new world, which is um, collectively produced web content. So, you know, Wikipedia, Facebook, YouTube, you know, if I put my very favorite, um, you know, uh, video of skateboarding squirrels or whatever, you know, on YouTube and, you know, Chris, you know, writes some flame, you know, why are you putting skateboarding squirrels on YouTube or whatever? You know, who owns that stuff? Does YouTube own it? Do I own it? Does Chris own this flame? The rights of all of this are really a brave new world because copyright, which came along around the time of, you know, the Constitution, essentially, you know, in the digital world, what does it mean to own something? What does it mean to have rights to something when you can disseminate it ever, anywhere at any time through these media? So all of that is really getting um, uh, particularly uh, confusing. Okay, so here are some uh, recommendations from uh, the, the task force. Okay, so the first uh, recommendation is um, uh, we have to think seriously about infrastructure whether we're doing it in our libraries, whether we're doing it in our government, whether we're um, uh, making it um, uh, advantageous for the private sector to do it. Some way or another, we have to get our infrastructure act together because all of the things that we're doing with this data depends on doing it, uh, especially data in the public sector and data in the research, and depends on having good infrastructure. Um, and we can do that. We can, for the cost of a supercomputer, you can create a lot of these spaces around the country. So, you know, this is a matter of the right programs, the right money, um, the right kinds of management going forward. Um, we want to create sustainability friendly policy, regulation, and agreements. Um, a lot of you um, use the creative commons. We want to, we want to allow people to preserve um, our, our stuff as a default. If I put something out there and the Internet Archive wants to scan the Internet and then use my stuff in some way, um, does it have to ask me permission to do that? And the question is, we want to just sort of sort out all of the rights issues so that we're protecting the right stuff, um, we're letting the other uh, right stuff uh, roam free in the digital universe. And, and we don't, we, we're, we haven't uh, gotten there yet. The Library of Congress has been um, working very hard in this uh, arena to try to sort of get the whole digital rights and sort it out. It's a big effort. We need to convene preservation-aware communities. Um, the, uh, the independent filmmakers, the uh, documentary filmmakers, all of those sorts of folks, they're starting to convene themselves as a community to try to understand, um, you know, how do you preserve these things that are not going to be a big blockbuster? That I can't, you know, turn around Avatar in 10 years as an old movie uh, with a director's cut or something like that. You know, there's lots of, lots of documentaries I'm not going to be able to do that yet. How am I going to keep them? Um, we can take individual uh, responsibility. We can provide non-exclusive rights to our stuff. Uh, we can plan for the whole data life cycle. So we can go home and back up our hard drives. You know, there are things we can do to make our own data 
uh, more protected. We could take those really important pictures of our kids and give them to our you know, brother-in-law or sister-in-law or you know, whatever and just make sure they're multiple copies. There are things that one can do individually. So we should just think this is such a humongous problem. There's nothing that you can do. You can do a lot. You can go home and explain to you know, your favorite person why preservation is important. If we raise the understanding of this, it will raise as, um, as a priority. And then, you know, that's the last thing. When, um, when Al Gore came out with an inconvenient truth, it really raised the visibility of the whole set of climate issues to the general public. It's not like climate scientists have been talking about this forever. But it raised it to a, a part where you could start um, having people look at these as priorities, having the general public understand what this is. This has happened for a lot of stuff, stem cell research. Y2K, you know, all these kinds of things. So, um, so you can you can do this as well. We'll all do this. Okay, let me just finish with like three quick slides. Um, I'm just this is just sort of the state of Fran's brain, which is always a scary thing uh, to talk to a bunch of people about. But there are things I've been thinking about because as we kind of create a data-driven society, um, there's all of these social structures that we're going to, in some sense, have to grapple with, that, um, that I think we don't know how to grapple with yet. So here's three of them that I've been thinking about, and I don't know the answers. First of all, quality of information. And um, you know, how do we know what's good, what's legitimate, what's valid? You know, if I go out on the internet, um, you know, is it going to be the case that um, 10 years, just making this up, 10 years from now, you know, there's no, um, you know, big deal journals, and, you know, I just put stuff out there on my web page, and just like Yelp, you know, you vote on whether you like my research or not. You know, could that happen? If you like Fran's research, uh, maybe you should go and read Chris's research, you know. Are we going to start seeing things like that? As we start seeing more of those in the real world, you know, how do we find good stuff? How do we vet good stuff? How do we assess it? What happens to peer review um, when anybody can put anything out? Um, if you're in an academic environment and you have the same kinds of structures we have, the uh, promotion and tenure, you know, is a URL going to count as a publication? You know, what, do, and what does any of that mean? And, you know, these are things, you know, we really don't know. And, for example, if you've ever been sick with something, with a disease that you didn't understand, and you went out and looked at the medical literature, and you try to try to figure out, you know, am I am I in the good shape guys or am I in the bad shape guys? You know, how do you know, you know, what's what's considered legitimate stuff by people in the area and what's not? And so that turns out to be something really challenging. If you came to me and said, you know, Fran, what about grid computing or high performance computing or something like that? Is this a good paper? And I could tell you, well, you know, I think that's maybe not the best paper. You might read this. But you know, how do you know when you don't have that context? That's going to be kind of continuity because it already is a really challenging thing for us. The second thing that you know worries me and maybe worries you too is sort of the ethics of discoverability. There's this whole notion of privacy and intrusiveness and control. You know, it's already annoying to me that um, every time I log into Facebook or look at my Gmail, you know, they're in my data pocket. They're picking my data pocket. These are two actual emails to me. Uh, you know, the names of the people who have been uh, disguised to uh, create an anonymity. <coughs> um, and, um, and these are the ads that Google put on, um, on my uh, Gmail site. You know, it read my email. Google read my email. And these are, are not, you know, these are things where you could get this in some roughly obvious way. But Google read my email, and now it's trying to market to me. Now, sometimes maybe that marketing is a good thing. Maybe I'm looking for a really hard to find article, and the fact is, you know, they found the you know, special advanced widgets and, you know, are marketing to me. But there's a lot of times where this is not welcome. So, you know, what part of this am I okay with? Is it okay with me that Google puts annoying ads? Um, uh, you know, maybe that's okay with me, but maybe it's not okay that you don't know that a human being who I don't see as, uh, you know, perhaps will not protect my privacy because of Google does. I don't know, you know, but this is a whole issue about the control of the information, the control of our own bits, the bits that describe and govern us. That's going to get harder before it gets easier. 
And then, you know, if you kind of look as this kind of goes on, you know, who makes the rules in the data universe? And the fact is we all kind of make this up ourselves as we go along. You know, I have my framework, you have your framework. Um, but in some sense, you know, we've just looked at um, some really high profile um, examples of someone wants to publish something and then there's some question about whether they'll let them publish it or not. Well, what if one uh, periodical lets them publish, you know, really bad information about how to make something that could, you know, mess up the world and uh, another publication won't? You know, who will make the rules about what's right, what's wrong, how we dispose of information, whether we can share it, whether we can own it? What do we do in a global world? on this. Perhaps each company, each country has some way of doing it. You know, do we need a data UN? Do we need, you know, some sort of body? You know, what are the countries for a data UN? So, you know, I think all of these kinds of issues are issues that are on the horizon. And we may not be there yet, but I think we're going to have to start learning about these things. And, um, uh, and I don't know the answer, but I'm confident that you guys will come up with these people. So with that, I'll take any questions, so thanks for your attention. Thanks, Fran, for a very thoughtful looking talk. We have some time for some questions. Yes. I, I just heard in the news that um, the European Union has, uh, more, has some guidelines or some laws about privacy on the internet. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, you're in this world too, I mean, as you look around the world, some countries have been extremely proactive about this. Um, the UK has been very proactive in the data space. Australia has been very proactive in the data space. Um, European Union is, is out there as well. Um, and we are lagging behind. And I'm not, um, I don't know the details of that, so I don't know whether, you know, these are you know, good rules, useful rules, bad rules or not. But the fact that they're actually trying to grapple with that problem, you know, I think is promising. Rob? What did you think when you did that? Well, I just wondered if there were some best practices that were, that we should try to leverage. Yeah. Rob? So, so I've heard recently that the UK was also ahead of us in trying to deal with the problem of the unified medical record system. And they spent a lot of money, and they were also ahead of us, and then it was a dismal failure. Yeah. And, and, and so we don't have to make 